I got a phone call in 2013 uh, from a friend who had graduated West Point and had moved on um, from her army career and said, hey, you know, I've seen some of your writing and I think it's time you interview some of us who graduated from West Point in the 9-11 generation. All of us have had some crazy stories. And so that to me was this light bulb moment of permission. I can, I can tell their story. Claire Gibson, it's so great to see you. Thank you so much for making time for us. Oh, it's already been a pleasure. I know. You, I feel like we should have turned the mics on 45 when minutes ago. I walked ago. in the door. Um, well, I'm really excited to talk to you about uh, your latest book, hmm. which is the one that uh, came out in 2019, mm -hmm. Beyond the Point. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'd like to talk about what you're working on right now. Mm -hmm. And then also just more generally, your background growing up um, as a sort of a creative kid in, hmm. you could say, a military uh, adjacent mm -hmm. situation. That's an interesting story. And that was kind of what led to the, the beyond the point. Mm -hmm. And then just, we'll see where, where it all goes, but just like how, uh, how you go about, um, writing mm -hmm. your process and why not, but let's start with, um, beyond the point. And I read it and enjoyed it. Good. And thank you. Thank you for letting me, um, well, I, we met at writer's fest, mm -hmm. uh, last year and that's when I got to know you. And I, I don't know every, very many people here in Nashville who've written novels. Hmm. You probably know a lot more. Yeah. There's quite a contingent, a growing contingent of yeah, us. Great. And of course the queen Supreme and Patchett who's written the most wonderful novels and, kind of like leads the pack, I think. But um, yeah, so many wonderful people here that I've been able to lean on. And um, I also, ha through writing a novel, you kind of start to build a network, mm -hmm. even of other people who are kind of in your class of like, kind of all of our books came out around mm -hmm. the same time. And, mm -hmm. um, and so I'm thankful for that. Uh, and community. so talk to me a little bit about where the, the um, desire to write this novel came from and where the opportunity came from. I read a little bit about it, but I'd love to hear it in your words. Sure. Yes. So I, like you said, I grew up as an army brat. My dad was a colonel by the time he retired from the army and we moved every couple of years my whole life. But when I was 10, we moved to West Point, which is the home of the U.S. Military Academy. And, and where is that? It's in upstate New York. In the Hudson Valley? or Correct. Yeah. And beautiful it's right area. on the river. It's beautiful. I'm ruined because, um, you know how, I think they, John Steinbeck talks about how, you know, just California get, got into his bones. And I feel that way about upstate New York. I only lived there seven or eight years, but that was the longest in my childhood I lived anywhere. And it's such a beautiful landscape. It's really quiet up there and the river's gorgeous and... It's a really it was a crazy place to grow up because you've got 4000 college aged kids who show up and they're there to not only do college but also to learn how to be officers in the US military. And by the time my family moved there, I think it was 1998 or 1997, um they had been admitting women for about you know, 20 years or something like that. 1976 was the first class of females that entered the academy. Mm. And so by the time I was a kid there, there were a good contingent of women that were cadets there doing all the same things that their male counterparts were doing, jumping out of airplanes, blowing things up, running through the woods in the summers. And I was just sort of a kid there like, this is cool. You know, mm. <laughs> like, what are they doing? And, um, but then, you know, 9-11 happened and suddenly all these cadets who we loved and cared for as members of the faculty and, you know, our family, all faculty members live on campus because it's a military installation. So it's very different from a different college campus in that way. And so we really knew these kids and they're from all over the country. And so they don't have a family to go home to. And there were no smartphones or really even, you know, personal computers were kind of still there early on. And so the kids would just come to our house to hang out and watch Saturday Night Live or whatever we were doing. And so suddenly when 9-11 happened, all of these people we loved suddenly were heading to war. And I was a kid and I just looked up to all of these men and women and felt really concerned for them and felt really helpless. And then I went to college a few years later and my professors were like very much trying to break apart um, the Bush administration and 
making me question the whole premise of the war in the first place. Mm -hmm. And that was really challenging and difficult for me because I had family members and friends that were there, you know, actively. Um, And all of that really stuck in my brain and just sort of was a conflict. I'm sure. What do I do with this storyline? And what do I do with all these people I love and people who genuinely gave their lives in that conflict? One of the um, impressions I drew from the book, uh, and it was a favorable one, was the um, the virtues of a campus like that and mm. the, the high calling of the students and, and the character forming that happens mm. in that that climate but also there i would imagine this you don't i don't think you get at this exactly in the book but um there's sort of a uniformity of of perception about the way the world is or our mm. values in, a, mm. in a, any military of necessity mm. and so i can imagine that having grown up in that you would absorb that along with everyone else. For sure. I mean, I still, to this day, <clears throat> if I wake up and the sun is already up, I'm like, oh, sh- crap. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm already late. Um, you know, you, I would wake up in my bed hearing people outside running and singing cadence. Uh-huh. And so in my brain, everyone is already a mile ahead of me. And... It's motivating. It's motivating or <laughs> shaming or something. Like it's, there's a, a lot little, there. A bit. <laughs> My therapy bills will uh, <laughs> tell a different story. But it it is motivating and it is inspiring. And it does get into your system where you're like, we do have something excellent here. Mm-hmm. And we were living on this beautiful piece of land that had so much history straight back to George Washington. Um, and I do believe that the American ideals of freedom and equality and a place to worship and express yourself, all of those things are still true and still valid. And there are people and we need people who are willing to fight for those values. Mm. And that, that will always be, you know, so important to me. And I'm so thankful for the people who are willing to do that. Um, And there's also kind of a toxic piece to a a school where it's mostly men, um, where women are sort of still at that point, still seen as outsiders. I think there's all kinds of problems that can come from that. Um, Not least of which is being aware that what we're fighting for as a country doesn't always translate when you take that to another another country, another culture, another Mm. place. And um, I think that was the conflict a lot of these women that I interviewed for the book kind of came up against. Mm. So, One of the things about the book that uh, I enjoyed and was surprised by, I have a lot of things, we may get into that, (laughs) um, was that it did really, because it focused on three female characters, the part of the book that took place, which is really about the first half, Mm -hmm. the part of the book that takes place at West Point, the the men really were on the periphery of the story. Sure. The the characters were about the the internal struggles of these three main characters, um, their connection to the female, the women's basketball team. Mm -hmm. Um, I liked, I thought I was surprised and I um, was like, well, that's kind of a cool dramatic uh, idea. Was that the the one of the primary villains was the female basketball coach? Sure. Instead of like, it would be more obvious to make the dude uh, a dude a, oh, a sure. villain, you know. But yeah. like, okay, cool. One of our own is like fighting well, against the cause. The reality is, women's sports is a minefield of its own. And my dad, after retiring from the army, ended up being an athletic director. So I had lots of stories from his second career to mine from. And when I went on book tour for this book, um, so many people that were West Point grads would come out and support. And many of them were like, oh, this must have been based on the soccer coach, right? Or this must have been based on the softball coach, right? And I was mm. like, uh-oh. Like, <laughs> it's, it, it they was, all had their own they stand-ins. All, everybody yeah. has. <laughs> if you played college sports and you were um, – I just think it's common. I think it's common that there are coaches that take things entirely too seriously. They lose the sense of the individual player in the midst of, you know, their legacy and their career. And um, I think that's what happened with this coach that I tried to depict in the book, that she's focused so much on her own neck that she forgets that these kids are really there to learn how to be military officers. And basketball was a 
you know, conduit to their time at West Point. It wasn't the reason mm -hmm. that they were, and it's definitely not what they're going to do when they leave. None of them are going pro. They're all going straight in the army. And post 9-11, they're all going straight to war. And this coach is still just completely lost in what the purpose of any of this is. Mm. And I think it's a, you know, in my life, like I'm constantly trying to reevaluate, like, do I have my eyes on the things that are the real things like am i worried about myself my career my you know whatever <laughs> fill in the blank mm -hmm. um or am i really thinking about the people around me and how i'm caring for them um because in the end that's i think that's what's the most important and i think she lost that as it's, coach it's really hard one of the things about life that is very hard is this just constant <laughs> 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 this constant um, need to accurately, accurately perceive yourself in relation to your larger life, your career, mm -hmm. the people around you, and keep those things in balance and know that um, you don't ever quite get it right. Mm -hmm. You know, there, I mean, there's countless stories of um, women and men who having kids sort of just disappear into the lives of their children mm -hmm. and no longer kind of forget themselves in their mm -hmm. own uh, pursuits, pursuits yeah. and, and joys and um, passions. Um, and likewise, there's a, another faction of, of parents that are terrible parents because they just are like, oh, I didn't really want to have kids and I'm going like, to do, I'm going to show up. Way. Yeah, you're in my way and mm -hmm. kids feel that. Mm -hmm. So I, I think about this a lot, um, you know, in like the Judeo-Christian tradition, this sense of the, the concept of an idol and idolatry. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not like we, we as moderners, we don't go um, worship the statue on the mountain. We we create idols of ourselves. We create idols of our. I think about like the current current culture. Like what shows up on my on my Instagram feed a lot right now are like fitness exercises because I'm <laughs> like, kind of uh -oh. into it. Do I have an idol? Yeah, no, totally. <laughs> I, whatever shows up on your Instagram feed totally. is your idol. It really because well, it's it's like giving you right what you're really excited for about. For sure. I mean, as you were speaking, I was thinking about like an idol is what you look at. Like what do you look? What are your eyes looking at? And for mm -hmm. All of us, it's like we're this is this is the posture that mm. we're in all the time, myself included. And that is the idol. And whatever that thing is that we think we're getting from it is the idol. So mm. for me, it's like connection. Like, does anybody see me? Does anybody see me here on a Tuesday putting peanut butter on a sandwich for my kids for the thousandth time? Does mm -hmm. does anyone care that I'm still here trying to write? Like I'm out here posting for that reason. Um, <laughs> and so is everybody else. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a little scary mm -hmm. to, to feel that way. And I don't know how we got on to talking about idols. Well, um, because, <laughs> oh, well, I think I, I did that. And um, I just, I was like thinking about it this morning because people are like really obsessed with life hacks. And that's like oh, showing sure. up all like, here, do this. And maybe mm. you can do this. Here's how to shave 10 seconds off of your morning commute. And mm. like, that's a... On, on one sense, it's like, yeah, I want to learn how to a better way to do everything. Mm -hmm. There's always that's one of the things like driving social media right now um, is this idea that we can improve ourselves. But I feel like that I the this obsession with self improvement is a like a a curse, mm -hmm. one of the curses of modern society. It's totally. like um, because it does come at the expense of um, chilling out and. <laughs> Enjoying enjoying life mm. and being in yourself and uh, in looking at the people with whom you share your life, your family and your friends, and yeah. realizing that, that God, at the end of the day, that's so much more important than your abs. Mm -hmm. um, and anyway, well, abs that, aren't bad. The abs aren't abs, there's, not no, bad. No, it's great, but it's, it's, it's like uh, all things in, in proportion. There's no such thing as <laughs> solutions. There's only trade-offs, right? That's Thomas Sell. Oh, that's good. Uh, um, what is that? There's only there's no such thing the, as solutions, only trade offs. Yeah, that's a yes. um, and that's something I'm ripped off from this uh, thinker Thomas L. Soul. Um, but it, it, that's so true in everything. And now maybe I'm going to try to bend this back toward our our creative conversation sure. because one of the things about writing is uh, it's a, a very grave trade off of time mm. for who knows what and to what purpose. And in that sense, it's really difficult to pursue <laughs> um to carve out the time to take the chance and that goes for mm -hmm. all creative things and um so my 
in, you know, in, and that can be a, an idol itself. Mm-hmm. You know, we got on this because of the basketball coach idolizing, in a sense, oh. creating an idol of her own career. Correct. And um, but we're all guilty of that. I think mm-hmm. it, it's impossible not to be as human beings. But anyway, how do you? How, how mm-hmm. did you when you were first? You know, 18, 19, 20, you could do anything. You mm-hmm. had some opportunities. You could be a doctor. You were a smart kid. Mm-hmm. You had I some privilege. Well, who knows? You could be something. <laughs> but you kind of started going into writing choice, and yeah. stepping in that direction. And mm-hmm. what, what drove that? And then as you've gone, well, let's start there. And then I'll sure. remember what I wanted to ask about today sure. in a moment. Yeah, I think, you know, I always kind of wanted to be a writer. That was always in my little spirit as a kid. I would write stories and pass them on loose leaf paper around the cafeteria. And I mean, just silly things like that. And when I went to college, I studied things that I thought would make me sound important to my military father and everyone back home. And I wanted to be a diplomat. That was sort of my path that Mm -hmm. I thought I was going to go down. And we had before the recording, we talked a little about about our China, various China experiences. So I had a lot of experience in China and thought that I would be moving toward working in the State Department um, with China. But then I had a, a difficult experience living there. And I thought, you know what, I don't think I can go back and live there longer. What do I really want to do? All of this I've been doing because it sounds important but what do I really want? And at the bottom of it, I just wanted to be a writer. And I had always kept blogs and journals. And actually, my college paid me to keep kind of a log of my experience of China. And in my brain, when I graduated college, I was like, hey, you're actually getting paid to write. Like, you should maybe pay attention to that. Mm. And I ended up doing Teach for America, which is what brought me to Nashville. Um, I needed a job and, you know, health insurance. But in the back of my brain, I was always wondering, like, how do I, how do I tell this story? And everything to me, as I walk through the world, I think about in terms of a story, you know. Um, and I got married and wasn't really happy teaching. And my husband, to his great credit, was just said, "Hey, well, what if, you, what could you do if you wanted to do anything? Like, what would you, what would you do?" Um, I said, "I think I would be a writer, but I have no idea how to do it." And he encouraged me to just start meeting with other people in Nashville who were writers. And that's how it all kind of began. Mm. I didn't have children yet. And so we were footloose, France free. And what and year was this and how old were goodness, you? Goodness, 2013. Oh, man, that's a lot of math. Oh, See, sorry. You don't, have have to do, you don't have to do the old part <laughs> or how old you were. Um, 2013. I was probably 25-ish. Yeah, okay. And um, <laughs> don't check my math. So... I started as a journalist because that felt like the easiest path to, you know, someone validates you and assigns you a, a story, you write it, they pay you onward. Mm-hmm. And I got, you know, picked up a few things locally and then a few things nationally. And that was, I just slowly built a portfolio in that way. But always in my brain, what I really wanted was to write a novel, just like you. I love reading, had always loved reading. I think it's this completely bananas experience where you can just sort of look at these words on a page and you're, you know, taken out of your circumstances. And, um, yeah, so I had this very, you know, intense experience of West Point, all of my writing experience, and I didn't quite know how to make them fit together. And I got a phone call in 2013, uh, from a friend who had graduated West Point and had moved on uh, from her army career and said, hey, you know, I've seen some of your writing and I think it's time you interview some of us who graduated from West Point in the 2011, or, I'm sorry, the 9-11 generation. All of us have had some crazy stories. And so that to me was this light bulb moment of permission. I can I can tell their story. And it started originally as this idea of a nonfiction story. But like I said, I love fiction. I love novels. And in the end, I thought, you know what? I really just want to tell this my way and not be beholden to, you know, dates and facts. facts. Like I just wanted to be able to tell the truth. And in many ways I could tell the truth better in fiction because, you know, there are certain coaches and things that might not have appreciated the way that I depicted them. And so it was nice to be able to, have that cover in mm. a way. 
Yeah. The, um, I mean, I've always been drawn to fiction for the same thing because fiction for all of its um, uh, indifference to accuracy sure. in the traditional sense has a power of getting at a deeper truth, mm. um, which is the point of fiction, you mm-hmm. know? Uh, <clears throat> And I just love, I mean, there are a few nonfiction writers that can do it well, like Laura Hillenbrand. She wrote um, Boys Unbroken, not Boy. I don't think she wrote Boys in the Boat, but mm. there's a few nonfiction writers that I think can really do it well and tell a story as they're delivering a lot of history or facts and information. And I can really appreciate when that happens. But to me, that's very rare. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want to write a military history book. I wanted to write a book about women that mm-hmm. happened to be in the military Mm -hmm. and um yeah and i hope i tried and i i i was proud i was proud of what came out of it the women who i interviewed all read it in the end and i think they were really proud of it and so that to me was success like i did a thing for them they will always get to hold on to this i get to hold on to this um it's a moment in time i hope i mean that was 10 years ago that i started writing it i know i'm a better writer now than i was when I started writing that book. And so I hope, you know, with my next project to be able to write an even more compelling story um, and and keep growing as a writer. So I'd love to unpack this a little, little bit to the extent that you can articulate that, but you said that you're a better writer now than you were then. And I have no doubt that's true, but could you in point to some ways in which you think that you're better? And what, <laughs> cause I think about this a lot because I think I'm a better mm. writer than I used to be, but I also, struggle yeah. with my own stuff. I mean, I think some of it is technical where mm. I remember a first draft, I think I wrote in little 400 word scenes, you know, which actually is not a bad way to put a draft together. Mm-hmm. But my agent, one of my agents that I was talking to, she was said, this is not going to work. This is, you need, you need to flesh out these characters a little bit more. You have three characters. The reader needs more time in that point of view before you keep kind of moving them along. Mm -hmm. Um, So pacing, Mm -hmm. I think sentence structure, you know, it's really easy to fall into patterns where you just tell the same, you know, subject, verb, predicate, you know, just over and over and over again. And I think having more style as you're writing, I think can help create more of a world and be more um, enjoyable to read Mm -hmm. and just sounds more mature as a writer than some of the ways that I was writing at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've read more books in 10 years than I had read then. And now I can learn from other writers and see like, oh, look how they did that or how they how they made that choice around um, what to reveal and what not to reveal and how do you do a flashback and how do you, like I, when I'm reading, I'm constantly paying attention to those details. Mm-hmm. Um, um, yeah, yeah I, I am too. And also I noticed that in the books that, are most um, compelling or resonate with me, I'm not. I forget. Oh, that's so true. Yeah, that's you know, a good point. I'll have to, I'll th- be that's thinking about point. it after the fact. I'm like, that is a masterful weave. Like when, like, yeah. give me, do you have any that come to mind? Books? I know what that's What was hard. the last, like, fantastic, oh, I can think of one, this is not a recent book. Um, Philippa Gregory wrote a book about um, the court of King Henry VIII, historical hmm. fiction. And, um, I often, for people who don't read, suggest that mm. as a book. Um, the highest praise I can offer any book is that it is unput downable, mm. and that book is unput downable. Mm. And it's um, it's called was called the other Bowling Girl, and it was made oh. into a terrible movie. But the yes, book, I think I read that like it was, a long time ago. I mean, yeah, a while ago. Yeah, yeah so the it's other not Bowling new. Girl. Yeah. Um, but that book was just so um, fun, mm-hmm. just, and I can't remember the structure of it. Mm-hmm. I do remember a couple of the particularly horrific scenes mm. to her credit. Um, but that, yeah, that was a long time ago. Um, I, mean, I felt that way. You know, I read um, Demon Copperhead last year, which won the Pulitzer. The Margaret At- Atwoods? It's uh, Barbara King. Barbara King Solver. I'm sorry. And it was this experience where I was so blown away and so ca- captivated and could not put it down and had to know what happened next. And at the same time, so blown away by her level of mastery and ability as a writer and wanting to break it all apart and understand how she did it. Um, and some of that you can get a little too in the weeds um, 
because you can't you can't copy anybody like you have to do it yourself and Mm -hmm. each story has its own mathematics that holds it together and there's no solution in some other book i think that's some a place that i often would get lost my first go round, like trying to find uh, some map somewhere that could help me get through my project Mm -hmm. and the reality is there is no map for the new thing that you're writing like you have to write the map Mm -hmm. um and that's frustrating it's hard yeah and even from Project to project, there's no map. What worked totally. for the last story is not going to work for this one. No. Um, you're the second person to recommend that new King Solver book in, oh, in the last two weeks. I mean, so I've got to, that's, I have to order that. It's promptly. a gut punch for sure. Like, be. I only read be, the Poisonwood Bible and I've okay. enjoyed that a lot. Yeah. So. She has several um, that are excellent. She's one of my ride or dies. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Not knowing the project or not having a template, not ever having a template, mm-hmm. uh, is basic to this um, this work that we do. And so, my question to you, and I feel of this um, acutely, is that the only way I learn how to write is by writing, mm-hmm. and um, the the path forward reveals itself. Mm-hmm. I am working on. Um, my second novel, the first one is not published yet, but I have a collection of short stories that came out a few years ago that um, I think I have a, if I have any strength or intuition for writing, it is in this short story category. I like, I can, I write, I notice that I write for emotion. Hmm. It comes out of an emotional place. And when I start writing, it gets that way quickly. Hmm. Um, no matter, happy, sad, what, intense, um, but structure, Character development; mm-hmm. um, those are things that are uh, learned, I think. And so, for you, let's talk about your process, um, and maybe let's just talk about what you're working on now and yeah. how you are setting about achieving this. Well, end life result. is very different now. Okay. Um, and I want to hear about your process too. But we can compare notes. I, I, well, I process even just that word. I'm like, I don't know. I, yeah, I, that sounds right. <laughs> I don't know. Um, when I wrote my first book, we didn't have kids. I lived in East Nashville. I went to Ugly Mugs every day at 6 a.m. And I wrote until about 10 a.m. And then I went to the gym. And then I did, had other jobs. I worked as a marketing Was, was person. the goal, first of all, or just, sorry to interrupt, was the goal um, word count or I time? Just, I just, just sat time. There. Sat in the chair. Yeah, butt in the chair. And that what people say. Mm-hmm. Um, and I knew I knew kind of where I was going with that story. And so if I was in the chair, I would it was inevitably, you know, the ball was gonna move forward. Mm-hmm. And that was the job. Um and then I also had other jobs. So I had other hats that I was wearing, and I found that to be very helpful because I could put the book away. I could go and do other things. I was working in marketing. I was coaching a girls lacrosse team. I was just sort of, I had more than one hat. Um, And then my husband and I had our two boys and COVID happened. And I had big plans for 2020 being the year that I write my second novel. And then I had a two-year-old and a newborn and nowhere to go. And that was really hard. (laughs) Um, And it kind of destroyed me creatively for a while, which I think COVID probably I don't know. I feel like it either did one or two. It either made you grow creatively or it destroyed you creatively. For me, it destroyed me creatively. And I struggled for to kind of revive after that for a couple of years. Didn't quite know what my second project was going to be. Um, was deep in the throes of motherhood and figuring out how to care for two crazy kids and, um, and how to love them well. And I had to completely rethink how am I going to do this during my day? Um, and that now my husband and I had to really come to terms because you mentioned this before, but you know, my writing, I, I made a little bit of money on my first book. I'm very lucky. I get a little check every now and then still, which is bananas. Like most debut novels don't get to do that. And I'm very, very grateful for how beyond the point did. Um, but it's not paying our bills by any stretch. Mm -hmm. And, could I do this if, you know, I I couldn't do this if I was single. And I want to say that because you have to be realistic and people come to me and they're like, oh, how, you know, I want to be a writer. And the reality is like you, this will not be, for most people, it is not a way to be able to feed yourself. And um, 
that stinks, you know, and I hope that that changes f- even for me. Mm-hmm. And um, I have a wonderful husband, but I have friends who don't have wonderful husbands and they up and leave. And then like, I think about that. <laughs> I'm like, mm-hmm. how would I support myself if it was just me? Um, so it, it is a trade off and it is a, a sacrifice and it is a little scary. And just because I have one book published does not mean my, my next book will, you know, 100% for sure get published. So I'm back at the desk writing and I have these two beautiful boys that I could be with. I'm choosing to be with this story and to try to bring this to life. And I've said it to my husband recently, like I've worked on this new thing now, three years going. If if this doesn't get published, will I feel like it was like I traded my children's childhood for this book, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And in some ways I have. And it is who I am. And I do think it's what I'm supposed to be doing. And, you know, we just moved into a new home and I have an office now, which is a revelation. Is a lock on the door and everything. <laughs> and my children, you know, it's summertime. They're home. They don't have school right now. And so I'm up at six. I write until nine. Patrick is, takes care of them during that time until he goes to work. And I just lock that door and they know not to come bother me. And it's that is my time that I'm working. And that that's enough for now. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, that's my process. Is that a process? That's know. a process. <laughs> I mean, uh, anything that puts a no- one word on a page is yeah. part of, is yeah. a success. I will say there's a couple of things that have been really helpful that I've learned. So last mm-hmm. year I went on a – I'm working on a book that's a historical fiction about a family saga. And I went to Italy on a research trip last year. And while there, the writer Danny Shapiro, who I'm – obsessed with. Um, I was in a workshop with her and she told me how to edit because I'd written all of this mess and I went to her and I said, Hey, what do I do now? You've read, she read 20 pages as my workshop group read the first 20 pages of this book I've been working on. And they, they kind of gave me a green light and I said, okay, great. I feel like I'm on to this story. This is moving in the right direction, but I have 300 pages and it doesn't make any sense. Like, what do I do now? And she gave me this great note, which was essentially print it all out and then delete the document and keep what you've written on this side of your page of your desk, open a new word document and start again and grab what you need when you need it, but essentially rewrite every word from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And from that point forward, I can- Which to normal human beings sounds crazy pills. It's madness. But I- not to me. I'm like, thank you. You're right. That's exactly yeah. what I should do. And I felt relief. And mm-hmm. my husband, I come home and he's like, what? And I'm like, it's great. I'm starting over. <laughs> did you do that? Yeah, I yeah. did. Yeah. And it took me about a year to write a second draft. And now I finished that second draft. It's much more in shape. It's still pretty messy. What do I do next? I printed the whole thing out and I'm starting fresh again. Mm-hmm. And I'm going through the whole thing. Now this process, I hope to go faster than a year. Um, but yeah, now I think that process has really helped me get out of the weeds because it's just hard when you, I don't know how you are doing with your second novel, but it's such a big document. It's really hard to manipulate and move things around once it gets that to that size mm-hmm. to, for me. Yeah. And to remember like what goes where and, and what's happening at what point and all of that. Um, yes, I, I, thinking about what you're saying and process and large projects versus small ones. And um, notice that I'm not 40,000 words into this next okay. project. Halfway. Um, yeah. Ha- halfway is kind of my idea. And I cannot remember the name of the character <laughs> from the very beginning. That's kind of the friend of the protagonist. Mm. And I'm just like, I don't care. I'm mm. calling it like, I think her name was Gwyneth in the first. And I now I've fixed that again. Mm. But like, I'm also writing on this, um, they call it a free write. Oh, I think it, I saw that on your Instagram. Yeah. And it, I was wondering how that is going for you. I don't like it at all. Um <laughs> And, uh, but that maybe they'll it's, sell you all kinds of tools to make you a better writer. And then you're like, <laughs> oh crap, it didn't work. <laughs> um, well, in the, the, well, I'll say that one of the things I do like about it is the feel of the keyboard is kind of old school oh, that's and nice. it's got like a, 
it's a very schlocky mm. kind of satisfying of sound. Yeah. Mm. Um, <laughs> and the idea behind it is that it does very few things. So mm. you can backspace, mm. but there's no moving a cursor around. So mm. you can't really edit. It's very difficult to edit mm. and write at okay. the same time. And that's the idea. It's like it's supposed to increase your just word count. But I'm just a total editor writer. And yeah. so I've, I'm like, okay, I'm going to – Continue the experiment hmm. for this first draft. So this forty four thousand words lives in that machine. Lives in that thing, but okay. it is connected to the internet, and um, all you have to do is hit one button, and it sends it to the email that you pre assigned. Okay. So it, there's always a copy. Okay. So I'm not worried about it lose. I mean, it would, be able, it would take a lot to lose all of that. And do you have to compile it all into a document out of your email, essentially? Um, I think, yeah, I've never okay. even, I just get an email and it, it's, it's so crude. It's just the first, the line, the subject of the email is the first line of and the it document. It always says the same thing. Yeah. Uh, and so all you'd have to do is cut, you know, select all, mm. dump it into the thing and start mm. editing, which is probably what I'll eventually do. Um, I found it to be, I, I can get really distracted. I can understand <clears throat> why someone would buy that kind of machine because it the internet is always available to you it's so mm. distracting everything is calling for your attention to just keep writing the story forward is incredibly difficult and for me i think printing it out starting fresh i would keep a little post it note or an index card and just write my page count on that index card and just watch that page count grow every mm -hmm. day and i actually have a friend who lives on your street do you know colin's a key no. He's a writer. and On this block of the street? On, I don't remember what part of the block. I'll find out later. But We'll have um, to delete that out. I don't want people finding out. <laughs> sorry, Collins. I, I outed you. <laughs> um, I have a friend named Collins Aki, and he and He lives I, somewhere in East Nashville. <laughs> correct. <Okay. laughs> and he and I will just text each other page count. Mm. So, like, I'll get a text from him in the morning that's, like, 35, and I'll text him back later. 120 or, mm. you know, he hits 147. And then I tell him, hey, actually, I deleted four pages. I'm back at page, what, you know, what we just go back and forth. That's it. If you looked at our text chain, it would just be numbers. People would think we were, you know, beautiful minding it. But it's just to have someone else know I am out here still trying to mm -hmm. add pages to this thing that I'm working on. Mm -hmm. um, that's so valuable. Mm -hmm. Because it is very lonely it's so to write lonely. in general. And then to write a novel is so lonely. It's is so even lonely. And it's so lonely for so long. Yeah, that's the part. <laughs> like, um, we had a, a guest on here, Shannon Miller, who's a talented writer. And um, I follow her on the gram. And she just posted something uh, a couple days ago where she's like, I'm celebrating 50,000 words on mm. my new book. And like, I was A, happy for her. Shout out to you, Shannon. I, you might be listening. Um, and be so encouraged mm. unto myself mm -hmm. because it's just like she she's out there doing it. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Maybe I can too. Mm -hmm. And it it, it is. Um, I, th I think there's something about writers that, um, in terms of personality, and I don't mean this in a bad way. I'll just say this about myself. That there's something about me. That's, I'll decide if I'm offended. Okay. Um, <laughs> I have a very plodding nature, sure. not plotting, but plotting. Mm. And I, I really will, I will force myself to do something that in the short term is I don't enjoy because mm. there's something crazy underneath that, that is, yes. that I will enjoy or the desire to arrange my universe in such a way that gives me personal meaning. And this thing that I aspire to and live in and have to have, which I would call aesthetic mm. or beauty um, or style. Um, that is, it's so important to me to have style in my life. I, you know, mm. I, whatever that means. I um, mean, e kind of everything. Mm -hmm. I love, I love cause style is personality. And I, I like my person. I like me, you know, yeah. and I like want to express me. That's amazing. <laughs> and, it's a gift. Not everybody goes through life getting a chance to feel that way or getting the freedom to feel that way. You know, a lot of people, it's like, there's just armor, 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 mm. armor. And I was, Mike Birbiglia, the comedian, says like no comedian should ever perform comedy before their family because comedy is essentially stripping mm -hmm. and like nobody wants to strip before you're like you don't want to strip before mom you know mm -hmm. and I feel like writing a novel is kind of similar in a way it's like here's my whole self and my whole perspective you know in this point in time and it's really 
it's going to, I mean, I hope I get a chance for this book to live out in the world. And that's very, you know, exposing Mm -hmm. in that way. So it's great when you are confident in who you are and confident in your style, because, um, because it's going to require that confidence if and when that thing goes to live I don't even know if it's confidence. It's just desire to live in it. Um, but, uh, do you, do you, are you competitive? I am, I am pretty competitive. So this is my theory. I think that writers are secretly the most competitive people in the world because it's a single person sport. It's like cross country, which I hate running, but me it's right now it's me versus the novel. Like Mm -hmm. who's going to outlast this thing. And at this point, I don't know if it'll be public. Like I think I have a hope. I have an agent. Like I have people who are on my team that want this thing to get made, but kind of at the heart of it, it's like, who's going to win? Is it going to be the novel who, like, in the resistance? Or can I beat this thing? Can I win? Can mm-hmm. I finish mm-hmm. the race? Um, yeah, there's, like, a little pride piece of me that's like, I have to finish this so that I win the competition between. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. I, I think about how is that, how can I relate to that material? Because it's not, for me, it's not me versus the novel. It's me versus hmm. my own, like, irrepressible domineering sense of self-criticism that's mm. ever present and yeah. no and no no more present than when I'm actively writing for sure and that is that is the evil that is the demon the thing maybe that that's it against. it's like it's me versus me it's me yeah. who has hope in this project and it's me who thinks it's a big fat waste of time mm-hmm. like which one of those versions of me is gonna win and <clears throat> here's, yeah. here's something know. I'd love to get your take on, um, which is something about influence. Um, and I'm big. Oh, that's me. I was like, God, God, <laughs> I have a podcast here. Somebody's calling. Um, is uh, I'm a big fan of classic literature, and I just have been mm-hmm. since I was a kid. And in my 20s, I I did two things basically. Uh, I made sure that I had very low rent, and <laughs> Um, I had ran a bluegrass band and, um, and I just read Russian literature oh, <laughs> basically. Yeah. And, um, that was, it suited me. It suited me. We'll say. And, you know, I, that's why I write I fell in love with beautiful writing. I mean, I could point to, um, in Anna Karenina, there's a passage in which one of the main characters spends, he's a, he's from the aristocracy and, um, f- for, reasons that don't matter to this moment in the story uh he decides to spend the day out with mm. the harvesters in his Levin. field and he just like the the writing about this experience of the scythe going through the the wheat mm-hmm. and the farmers resting in the shade god it still gives me chills i'm just yeah. like that's you know i we all maybe in our creative endeavors can point to, or th- maybe point to a forced to um, a moment that made them want to break into that and mm-hmm. participate in that community or, or have a try. Yeah. And, you know, I had some of these formative experiences um, like that one mm-hmm. made me want to go like, I want to have a try at that. Mm-hmm. Um, but then, so that very thing that drew me in is down the bar by which I'm judged. <laughs> And, and I cannot, I'll yeah, never. Like, turns I'll, out you're not Tolstoy. It like. turns out. <laughs> it turns out. but And so it's okay. There's already Neither Tolstoy and that's fine. But five cent it's, stamp. You still got to be, yeah, you still got your five cent stamp. I, I think that was an off, off, off mic <laughs> oh, shoot. conversation. Maybe we got it in there. I can't remember. Um, but yeah, it's like, I, you know, I can't worry about that, obviously. And that's just stupid. And for a million reasons, there's uh, this generation won't produce a tro- Tolstoy, na- you know, not the least of which is the prevalence of the internet in every aspect of life um we just don't slow down Mm. enough to do something that deep and huge but uh i i noticed that i do have a desire and i i still keep like reading classic i love classics you Mm. know i just love the best of things Mm -hmm. apparently in literature especially and i'm like i gotta stop doing this because i the more i taken the most beautiful things ever written in, mm. in the English canon. I'm like, it is squishing it's me. Depressing it's depressing you? It, it's, it's, yeah, it's like, I love, as a reader, as, as a participant in the consumption of literature, there's nothing more inspiring than reading 
the most beautiful things that yeah. can, and also just like putting my mind against something that's difficult, totally. you know, like reading Faust or reading something that isn't just like revealing itself on first right. listen or so much of that classic literature is not written in a conversational style and everything now is written in a conversational yes. style. And I'm actually rereading tale of two cities right now, mm. Dickens. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's, it's a, it's a difficult read mm -hmm. and, it is difficult because each sentence is not written in order to be completely clear. Like clarity is not the goal. Beauty mm -hmm. is the goal. Mm -hmm. And if you get on board with that, then it's actually quite fun to read because it's almost like you're decoding meaning and there's double meaning and there's jokes hidden in the wordplay and there's so much there. Mm -hmm. um, but it is not going to – I don't think a book like that would sell now because – people don't want to work that hard, <laughs> to be honest. And I don't really even want to work that hard most days. Um, but I'm curious, you said before that it was squishing you. What do you mean by that? Well, who who am I to try? When to try to write the, in that way. Of these gods, yeah. Um, well, and who were they? Like, they no, I, no, I know. Until I, I, they you wrote a thing, I mean, that's, right? that's why I still put out my 500 words a day, is that somehow <laughs> I'm like, well, I'm still fucking here. Yeah. And this is my life and my one in time you know, mm. that I get to experience what it is to be alive and yeah. I have a valid take and it you know, might not be masterful. I, I have a friend who wrote on Facebook the other day, like, no one should be able to write a memoir before they're 40. Like there should be a rule. And then he said, although I did really like George Orwell's memoir and he wrote that when he was 36 or he said something along those lines. George Orwell died when he was 46. So I'm like, what are, we can't, None of us know how long we have here. None of us know what role our stories are going to play. Yeah, most likely they're going to end up in the bargain bin. Like, that's the reality for a lot of people. Barbara Kingsolver, maybe not so much. But go to a place like Italy and you see all these busts of these famous emperors that lived at one time. I have no idea who any of them are. No one knows really some of them who they are. They have statues of them up in the forum. Mm -hmm. History has moved forward. No one knows, like, no one's going to care. No one's going to care in 100 years. But yeah. who is going to care, I think, are my children and my children's children and maybe a small circle of people who read this and it gives them a bit of hope in their life. It gives them a bit of joy and escape and a bit of meaning. Um and I think that's gonna be that's gonna be enough for me. You know, the thing you were talking about about beauty being part of what inspires you. The thing I love most in literature is when they the author is able to kind of take you on this journey. Danny Shapiro has a novel that came out a few years ago called Signal Fires, and she did such an excellent job with this. Um, it's all kind of centered around this tree in this neighborhood, and her novel kind of drops in and out of the timeline in this neighborhood over the course of 30 years or something like that. And what she does so well and what great literature in my mind does so well is it helps us come out of our own timeline for just like a tiny minute and to see how the threads of our lives intersect and kind of the domino effect of one life on another. And that is what I love most about literature is its ability to kind of like take you take you out of yourself for a minute and help you see from a higher perspective that there's so much more at play here than what we just see day to day driving down the street. Or I would add to that and just, or say even just someone else's perspective, oh. higher or or not. Yes. To me, that's been a hugely motivating thing that keeps me coming back to fiction over and over again is the ability to put on somebody else's clothes and walk around mm. and uh, even bad people or whatever people mm -hmm. I thought were bad or, mm. you know, there's a book that um, just got made into another probably mediocre dr television drama <laughs> um, called Shogun that's out there on oh, I think, yeah, FX I've right now. The... And it was a, written by James Clavell in the 60s. It's a huge tome, like mm. a thousand pager. Um, and 
he does something fairly masterful in that arc of a story where he puts you in the the protagonist is uh, I want to say like a Dutch merchant marine in the 16th century who is shipwrecked on Japan mm-hmm. and his first impression he's he's civilization and his first impression of J- Japanese society is his witnessing the beheading of a mm. local villager by a uh, a fiefdom lord mm. and he's just like oh my god these people are barbaric and by the end of the story mm. you, and you through his eyes and his journey over you know these a thousand pages probably you're like oh my god the westerners are the barbarians for sure and it's like it's pretty masterful and i right. like that was a that was a clue to me as to the value of of fiction and of literature um and uh, i got to start I'm trying to turn that off it's too late now. Uh, is the you know? It's like anyone can make an argument for a thing, but mm-hmm. that's not very powerful because it's it's really is difficult to convince people of a new opinion that they don't already oh, have. Well, but yeah. if you show, if you let them lead themselves into it through their own emotions, emotions are extraordinarily powerful, and they're a lot more than just something that happens that pulls us and makes us have happy days and sad days and whatever. They really are the foundations of our our moral underpinnings Mm -hmm. and i think that fiction when when in drama in general when when you can get somebody to empathize with a character who lives or believes a different way you're really pulling off a a pretty powerful master stroke totally um so that's one thing i like about fiction um it's nearly impossible to do have you read george saunders any of his no, but my okay. uh, we had a guest, uh, Robert Ellis. He's uh-huh. he's probably by the time this airs, um, he'll, his episode will be back out. And we spent so much time talking about books, to my surprise, both on and off the air. And uh, he mentioned Saunders as being like his one of his favorite he's contemporaries. Excellent, and he has a sh- he has a book called A Swim in the Pond in the Rain. It's probably old news now, but that's the one he mentioned. It is <clears throat> Russian literature, you so you would love it, and he takes these short stories by the Russian great writers. And then every other chapter is George Saunders sort of explaining how the writer does what they do and and why it works. And a lot of what happens in those short stories, which I've never really tried to write a short story, and I'm that scares me in a lot of ways. It's a goal I have one day, but it, it hasn't happened yet. But they just the economy of words and the ability to pull off what you're talking about, that shift in perspective for your main character, starting out with one expectation of how the world works and coming out with a completely different kind of upside down version. Mm -hmm. It it happens over and over and over again in those short stories. And it's just a good, it's a good study for someone who wants to know better how to do that, which I'm constantly trying to know better how to do that. So Um, I have to check that out. Yeah. That's 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 too double recommendations I know. now. King Solver and Saunders. There you go. One of the, the best things about um, participating in any sort of creative enterprise is the community around mm. that you you suddenly find yourself in. And um, so, and with that community comes um, recommendations. Yeah. And recommendations to me, in literature or songs or otherwise, are just so much more valuable than an algorithm. Mm. You know, something that is mm. just generated by something, uh, a computer program uh, that thinks that you might like this thing. Because sure. you may well like it. Yeah. But when someone, a friend tells you about it, then you already, in advance of your experience of that song or book, have a connection to a living aspect of your, your own life. Mm. Um, so you're, do you have a title, a working title for the new book? I have a couple that I'm toying around with. I haven't quite landed on a title, but I'll say this. It's it's a story of a family who over the course of a hundred years is impacted in each generation by adoption in some way. Mm-hmm. And I I don't have a title that I can quite share, but it's it's closer than it's ever been. And I'm really proud of it and I'm really hopeful that it will do what I'm trying to pull off. Um, so, yeah. I, and the last thing I might want to say about that, the, the reward that you may or may not experience when you set out to write something, um, and because I, I do agree that none of this really matters. Mm. Um, 100 years from now, if they're very small chance that anyone will ever remember me. Um, I'm fine with that. I don't care. And But I do notice that having had some small success in writing, mm. I... And having, you know, like I can 
point to that finished book. Um, there's a few of them in a stack over there. Uh, and on really much, really every page, I can look at that and be like, that's me, mm. you know? Mm-hmm. I'd, I'd, I'd live or die on that. You know, mm-hmm. you can judge me on this. Mm-hmm. Like, and that's that's enough. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know whether I can honestly say that I don't care that people will forget me. <laughs> I think I would like, if I'm really genuinely honest, that's a part of, I don't know, I think, I think probably everyone deep down feels that call to eternity that's like I don't want to be forgotten Mm. um but while we're here what can I do to make this place a little bit better and for me that's writing a story like what we were just saying that can take someone out of their own experience put them into somebody else's shoes think about something a little bit differently open their brain to the possibility that they were wrong about something And, you know, for my, for this story, like I'm an adoptive mom, the story that I'm working on is, is very heavily about adoption. And I, my fear is I would never want to write something that's only positive about adoption or only negative about adoption. The truth is way more complicated than that. Um, And by the end of the story, I still do have a point of view on it. And that is that my kids matter and that all kids matter. And there is no there is no shade of of value based on where you're born, how you're born, who raises you, who didn't raise you. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, to me, that's something worth telling and worth giving my life to try to tell. So I look forward to reading it. Yeah. when the book comes out, we'll Thank have to you. have you back. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Mm-hmm. Hey, thanks for watching. Go ahead and click here to like and subscribe. You can click right there to watch another video or click here to watch a playlist featuring the songs of the Morse Code Podcast. Okay, thank you very much.